people have always wanted answers to the big questions. Where did we come from? How did the universe begin? What is the meaning and design behind it all? Is there anyone out there? The creation accounts of the past now seem less relevant and credible. They have been replaced by a variety of what can only be called superstitions, ranging from New Age to Star Trek. But real science can be far stranger than science fiction, and much more satisfying. I am a scientist. And a scientist with a deep fascination with physics, cosmology, the universe and the future of humanity. I was brought up by my parents to have an unwavering curiosity and, like my father, to research and try to answer the many questions that science asks us. I have spent my life traveling across the universe, inside my mind. Through theoretical physics, I have sought to answer some of the great questions. At one point, I thought I would see the end of physics as we know it, but now I think the wonder of discovery will continue long after I am gone. We are close to some of these answers, but we are not there yet. The problem is, most people believe that real science is too difficult and complicated for them to understand. But I don't think this is the case. To do research on the fundamental laws that govern the universe would require a commitment of time that most people don't have. The world would soon grind to a halt if we all tried to do theoretical physics. But most people can understand and appreciate the basic ideas if they are presented in a clear way without equations, which I believe is possible and which is something I have enjoyed trying to do throughout my life. It has been a glorious time to be alive and doing research in theoretical physics. Our picture of the universe has changed a great deal in the last 50 years, and I'm happy if I have made a contribution. One of the great revelations of the space age has been the perspective it has given humanity on ourselves. When we see the Earth from space, we see ourselves as a whole. We see the unity, and not the divisions. It is such a simple image with a compelling message, one planet, one human race. I want to add my voice to those who demand immediate action on the key challenges for our global community. I hope that going forward, even when I am no longer here, people with power can show creativity courage and leadership. Let them rise to the challenge of the sustainable development goals, and act, not out of self-interest, but out of common interest. I am very aware of the preciousness of time. Seize the moment. Act now. I have written about my life before but some of my early experiences are worth repeating as I think about my lifelong fascination with the big questions. I was born exactly 300 years after the death of Galileo. And I would like to think that this coincidence has had a bearing on how my scientific life has turned out. However, I estimate that about 200,000 other babies were also born that day. I don't know whether any of them were later interested in astronomy. I grew up in a tall, narrow Victorian house in Highgate, London, which my parents had bought very cheaply during the Second World War when everyone thought London was going to be bombed flat. In fact, a V-2 rocket landed a few houses away from ours. I was away with my mother and sister at the time, and fortunately my father was not hurt. For years afterwards, there was a large bomb site down the road in which I used to play with my friend Howard. We investigated the results of the explosion with the same curiosity that drove me my whole life. In 1950, my father's place of work moved to the northern edge of London, to the newly constructed National Institute for Medical Research in Mill Hill. So my family relocated to the cathedral city of St. Albans nearby. I was sent to the high school for girls, which despite its name took boys up to the age of 10. Later I went to St. Albans school. I was never more than about halfway up the class. It was a very bright class, but my classmates gave me the nickname Einstein, so presumably they saw signs of something better. When I was 12, one of my friends bet another friend a bag of sweets that I would never come to anything. I had six or seven close friends in St. Albans, and I remember having long discussions and arguments about everything, from radio-controlled models to religion. One of the big questions we discussed was the origin of the universe, and whether it required a god to create it and set it going. I had heard that light from distant galaxies was shifted towards the red end of the spectrum and this was supposed to indicate that the universe was expanding. But I was sure there must be some other reason for the red shift. Maybe light got tired and more red on its way to us? An essentially unchanging and everlasting universe seemed so much more natural. It was only years later, after the discovery of the cosmic microwave background about two years into my PhD research, that I realized I had been wrong. 
I was always very interested in how things operated, and I used to take them apart to see how they worked, but I was not so good at putting them back together again. My practical abilities never matched up to my theoretical qualities. My father encouraged my interest in science and was very keen that I should go to Oxford or Cambridge. He himself had gone to University College, Oxford, so he thought I should apply there. At that time, University College had no fellow in mathematics, so I had little option but to try for a scholarship in natural science. I surprised myself by being successful. The prevailing attitude at Oxford at that time was very anti-work. You were supposed to be brilliant without effort, or to accept your limitations and get a fourth-class degree. I took this as an invitation to do very little. I'm not proud of this, I'm just describing my attitude at the time, shared by most of my fellow students. One result of my illness has been to change all that. When you are faced with the possibility of an early death, it makes you realize that there are lots of things you want to do before your life is over. Because of my lack of work, I had planned to get through the final exam by avoiding questions that required any factual knowledge and focus instead on problems in theoretical physics. But I didn't sleep the night before the exam and so I didn't do very well. I was on the borderline between a first and second class degree, and I had to be interviewed by the examiners to determine which I should get. In the interview they asked me about my future plans. I replied that I wanted to do research. If they gave me a first, I would go to Cambridge. If I only got a second, I would stay in Oxford. They gave me a first. In the long vacation following my final exam, the college offered a number of small travel grants. I thought my chances of getting one would be greater the further I proposed to go, so I said I wanted to go to Iran. In the summer of 1962 I set out, taking a train to Istanbul, then on to Erzurum in eastern Turkey, then to Tabriz, Tehran, Isfahan, Shiraz and Persepolis, the capital of the ancient Persian kings. On my way home, I and my traveling companion, Richard Chien, were caught in the Buinzara earthquake, a massive 7.1 Richter quake that killed over 12,000 people. I must have been near the epicenter, but I was unaware of it because I was ill and in a bus that was bouncing around on the Iranian roads that were then very uneven. We spent the next several days in Tabriz, while I recovered from severe dysentery and from a broken rib sustained on the bus when I was thrown against the seat in front, still not knowing of the disaster because we didn't speak Farsi. It was not until we reached Istanbul that we learned what had happened. I sent a postcard to my parents, who had been anxiously waiting for 10 days because the last they had heard I was leaving Tehran for the disaster region on the day of the quake. Despite the earthquake, I have many fond memories of my time in Iran. Intense curiosity about the world can put one in harm's way, but for me this was probably the only time in my life that this was true. I was 20 in October 1962, when I arrived in Cambridge at the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics. I had applied to work with Fred Hoyle the most famous British astronomer of the time. I say astronomer, because cosmology then was hardly recognized as a legitimate field. However, Hoyle had enough students already, so to my great disappointment I was assigned to Dennis Sama, of whom I had not heard. But it was just as well I hadn't been a student of Hoyle, because I would have been drawn into defending his steady-state theory, a task which would have been harder than negotiating Brexit. I began my work by reading old textbooks on general relativity, as ever, drawn to the biggest questions, as some of you may have seen from the film in which Eddie Redmayne plays a particularly handsome version of me, in my third year at Oxford I noticed that I seemed to be getting clumsier. I fell over once or twice and couldn't understand why, and I noticed that I could no longer row a sculling boat properly. It became clear something was not quite right and I was somewhat disgruntled to be told by a doctor at the time to lay off the beer. The winter after I arrived in Cambridge was very cold. I was home for the Christmas break when my mother persuaded me to go skating on the lake in St. Albans, even though I knew I was not up to it. I fell over and had great difficulty getting up again. My mother realized something was wrong and took me to the doctor. I spent weeks in St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London and had many tests. In 1962, the tests were somewhat more primitive than they are now. A muscle sample was taken from my arm, I had electrodes stuck into me and radio-opaque fluid was injected into my spine, which the doctors watched going up and down on x-rays, as the bed was tilted. 
they never actually told me what was wrong, but I guessed enough to know it was pretty bad, so I didn't want to ask. I had gathered from the doctor's conversations that it, whatever it was, would only get worse, and there was nothing they could do except give me vitamins. In fact, the doctor who performed the tests washed his hands of me and I never saw him again. At some point I must have learned that the diagnosis was amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, a type of motor neuron disease, in which the nerve cells of the brain and spinal cord atrophy and then scar or harden. I also learned that people with this disease gradually lose the ability to control their movements, to speak, to eat and eventually to breathe. My illness seemed to progress rapidly. Understandably, I became depressed and couldn't see the point of continuing to research my PhD, because I didn't know if I would live long enough to finish it. But then the progression slowed down and I had a renewed enthusiasm for my work. After my expectations had been reduced to zero, every new day became a bonus, and I began to appreciate everything I did have. While there's life, there is hope. And, of course, there was also a young woman called Jane, whom I had met at a party. She was very determined that together we could fight my condition. Her confidence gave me hope. Getting engaged lifted my spirits, and I realized, if we were going to get married, I had to get a job and finish my PhD. And as always, those big questions were driving me. I began to work hard and I enjoyed it. To support myself during my studies, I applied for a research fellowship at Gondlin Kualis College. To my great surprise, I was elected and have been a fellow of Keys ever since. The fellowship was a turning point in my life. It meant that I could continue my research despite my increasing disability. It also meant that Jane and I could get married, which we did in July 1965. Our first child, Robert, was born after we had been married about two years. Our second child, Lucy, was born about three years later. Our third child, Timothy, would be born in 1979. As a father, I would try to instill the importance of asking questions, always. My son Tim once told a story in an interview about asking a question which I think at the time he worried was a bit silly. He wanted to know if there were lots of tiny universes dotted around. I told him never to be afraid to come up with an idea or a hypothesis no matter how daft, his words not mine, it might seem. The big question in cosmology in the early 1960s was did the universe have a beginning? Many scientists were instinctively opposed to the idea, because they felt that a point of creation would be a place where science broke down. One would have to appeal to religion and the hand of God to determine how the universe would start off. This was clearly a fundamental question, and it was just what I needed to complete my Ph.D. thesis. Roger Penrose had shown that once a dying star had contracted to a certain radius, there would inevitably be a singularity, that is a point where space and time came to an end. Surely, I thought, we already knew that nothing could prevent a massive cold star from collapsing under its own gravity until it reached a singularity of infinite density. I realized that similar arguments could be applied to the expansion of the universe. In this case, I could prove there were singularities where space-time had a beginning. A eureka moment came in 1970, a few days after the birth of my daughter, Lucy. While getting into bed one evening, which my disability made a slow process, I realized that I could apply to black holes the casual structure theory I had developed for singularity theorems. If general relativity is correct and the energy density is positive, the surface area of the event horizon, the boundary of a black hole, has the property that it always increases when additional matter or radiation falls into it. Moreover, if two black holes collide and merge to form a single black hole, the area of the event horizon around the resulting black hole is greater than the sum of the areas of the event horizons around the original black holes. This was a golden age, in which we solved most of the major problems in black hole theory even before there was any observational evidence for black holes. In fact, we were so successful with the classical general theory of relativity that I was at a bit of a loose end in 1973 after the publication with George Ellis of our book The Large Scale Structure of Space-Time. My work with Penrose had shown that general relativity broke down at singularities, so the obvious next step would be to combine general relativity, the theory of the very large, with quantum theory, the theory of the very small. In particular, I wondered, can one have atoms in which the nucleus is a tiny primordial black hole, formed in the early universe? 
my investigations revealed a deep and previously unsuspected relationship between gravity and thermodynamics, the science of heat, and resolved a paradox that had been argued over for 30 years without much progress. How could the radiation left over from a shrinking black hole carry all of the information about what made the black hole? I discovered that information is not lost, but it is not returned in a useful way, like burning an encyclopedia but retaining the smoke and ashes. To answer this, I studied how quantum fields or particles would scatter off a black hole. I was expecting that part of an incident wave would be absorbed, and the remainder scattered. But to my great surprise I found there seemed to be a mission from the black hole itself. At first, I thought this must be a mistake in my calculation. But what persuaded me that it was real was that the emission was exactly what was required to identify the area of the horizon with the entropy of a black hole. This entropy, a measure of the disorder of a system, is summed up in this simple formula S equals Ac3 backslash 4GH which expresses the entropy in terms of the area of the horizon and the three fundamental constants of nature, c, the speed of light, g, Newton's constant of gravitation, and h, Planck's constant. The emission of this thermal radiation from the black hole is now called Hawking radiation and I'm proud to have discovered it. In 1974, I was elected a fellow of the Royal Society. This election came as a surprise to members of my department because I was young and only a lowly research assistant. But within three years I had been promoted to professor. My work on black holes had given me hope that we would discover a theory of everything, and that quest for an answer drove me on. In the same year, my friend Kip Thorne invited me and my young family and a number of others working in general relativity to the California Institute of Technology, Caltech. For the previous four years, I had been using a manual wheelchair as well as a blue electric three-wheeled car, which went at a slow cycling speed and in which I sometimes illegally carried passengers. When we went to California, we stayed in a Caltech-owned colonial-style house near campus and there I was able to enjoy full-time use of an electric wheelchair for the first time. It gave me a considerable degree of independence, especially as in the United States buildings and sidewalks are much more accessible for the disabled than they are in Britain. When we returned from Caltech in 1975, I initially felt rather low. Everything seemed so parochial and restricted in Britain compared to the can-do attitude in America. At the time, the landscape was littered with dead trees killed by Dutch elm disease and the country was beset by strikes. However, my mood lifted as I saw success in my work and was elected, in 1979, to the Lucasian Professorship of Mathematics, a post once held by Sir Isaac Newton and Paul Dirac. During the 1970s, I had been working mainly on black holes but my interest in cosmology was renewed by the suggestions that the early universe had gone through a period of rapid inflationary expansion in which its size grew at an ever-increasing rate, like the way prices have increased since the UK's Brexit vote. I also spent time working with Jim Hartle, formulating a theory of the universe's birth that we called No Boundary. By the early 1980s, my health continued to worsen and I endured prolonged choking fits because my larynx was weakening and was letting food into my lungs as I ate. In 1985, I caught pneumonia on a trip to CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, in Switzerland. This was a life-altering moment. I was rushed to the Lucerne Cantonal Hospital and put onto a ventilator. The doctor suggested to Jane that things had progressed to the stage where nothing could be done and that they turn off my ventilator to end my life. But Jane refused and had me flown back to Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge by air ambulance. As you may imagine this was a very difficult time, but thankfully the doctors at Addenbrooke's tried hard to get me back to how I had been before the visit to Switzerland. However, because my larynx was still allowing food and saliva into my lungs, they had to perform a tracheostomy. As most of you will know, a tracheostomy takes away the ability to speak. Your voice is very important. If it is slurred, as mine was, people can think you are mentally deficient and treat you accordingly. Before the tracheostomy my speech was so indistinct that only people who knew me well could understand me. My children were among the few who could do so. For a while after the tracheostomy, the only way I could communicate was to spell out words letter by letter, by raising my eyebrows when someone pointed to the right letter on a spelling card. Luckily a computer expert in California named Walt Woltis heard of my difficulties. 
he sent me a computer program he had written called Equalizer. This allowed me to select whole words from a series of menus on the computer screen on my wheelchair by pressing a switch in my hand. Over the years since then, the system has developed. Today I use a program called Akot, developed by Intel, which I control by a small sensor in my glasses via my cheek movements. It has a mobile phone, which gives me access to the internet. I can claim to be the most connected person in the world. I have kept the original speech synthesizer I had, however, partly because I haven't heard one with better phrasing, and partly because by now I identify with this voice, despite its American accent. I first had the idea of writing a popular book about the universe in 1982, around the time of my No Boundary work. I thought I might make a modest amount to help support my children at school and meet the rising costs of my care. But the main reason was that I wanted to explain how far I felt we had come in our understanding of the universe, how we might be near finding a complete theory that would describe the universe and everything in it. Not only is it important to ask questions and find the answers, as a scientist I felt obligated to communicate with the world what we were learning. Appropriately enough, A Brief History of Time was first published on April Fool's Day in 1988. Indeed, the book was originally meant to be called From the Big Bang to Black Holes, A Short History of Time. The title was shortened and changed to Brief, and the rest is history. I never expected A Brief History of Time to do as well as it has. Undoubtedly, the human interest story of how I have managed to be a theoretical physicist and a best-selling author despite my disabilities has helped. Not everyone may have finished it or understood everything they read but they at least grappled with one of the big questions of our existence and got the idea that we live in a universe governed by rational laws that, through science, we can discover and understand. To my colleagues, I'm just another physicist, but to the wider public I became possibly the best known scientist in the world. This is partly because scientists, apart from Einstein, are not widely known rock stars, and partly because I fit the stereotype of a disabled genius. I can't disguise myself with a wig and dark glasses, the wheelchair gives me away. Being well known and easily recognizable has its pluses and minuses, but the minuses are more than outweighed by the pluses. People seem genuinely pleased to see me. I even had my biggest ever audience when I opened the Paralympic Games in London in 2012. I have led an extraordinary life on this planet, while at the same time traveling across the universe by using my mind and the laws of physics. I have been to the furthest reaches of our galaxy, traveled into a black hole and gone back to the beginning of time. On Earth, I have experienced highs and lows, turbulence and peace, success and suffering. I have been rich and poor, I have been able-bodied and disabled. I have been praised and criticized, but never ignored. I have been enormously privileged, through my work, in being able to contribute to our understanding of the universe. But it would be an empty universe indeed if it were not for the people I love, and who love me. Without them, the wonder of it all would be lost on me. And at the end of all this, the fact that we humans, who are ourselves mere collections of fundamental particles of nature, have been able to come to an understanding of the laws governing us, and our universe, is a great triumph. I want to share my excitement about these big questions and my enthusiasm about this quest. One day. I hope we will know the answers to all these questions. But there are other challenges, other big questions on the planet which must be answered, and these will also need a new generation who are interested and engaged, and have an understanding of science. How will we feed an ever-growing population, provide clean water, generate renewable energy, prevent and cure disease and slow down global climate change? I hope that science and technology will provide the answers to these questions, but it will take people human beings with knowledge and understanding, to implement these solutions. Let us fight for every woman and every man to have the opportunity to live healthy, secure lives, full of opportunity and love. We are all time travelers, journeying together into the future. But let us work together to make that future a place we want to visit. Be brave, be curious, be determined, overcome the odds. It can be done. What was your dream when you were a child? and did it come true. I wanted to be a great scientist. However, I wasn't a very good student when I was at school, and was rarely more than halfway up my class. My work was untidy, and my handwriting not very good. But I had good friends at school, and we talked about everything and, specifically, the origin of the universe. This is where my dream began, 
and I am very fortunate that it has come true.